I'm always amused when I hear people having a conversation in, in French because every now and then they don't have the word for it. They throw in an English word. So uh, there's a word that has no translation. So, uh, you know, they talk about le weekend or le sandwich. And we do the same. There's, there's no English equivalent to bon appétit, is there? We just import the word from another language and it becomes eventually part of our language. And a word that has become part of our language, maybe over, over our lifetimes, is, is the word genre. It means a style, especially in the arts, that involves a particular set of characteristics. And it's important when we're reading or listening to or watching something that we understand what genre we're dealing with. We don't read poetry in the same way as we read a mathematical textbook and vice versa. And if we do, we're likely to misunderstand. Now, the classic illustration, I think, was the famous radio production of the War of the Worlds in America in 1938. It was read so dramatically and produced in such a style that listeners really thought they were being invaded by aliens. Telephone switchboards jammed, people were running away from homes. There was panic because they'd misunderstood the genre. So what genre is this book of Jonah? It is unique in the Bible. It's located amongst the books of prophecy, and it starts, the word of the Lord came to Jonah. And that's exactly how the following book uh, Micah starts, the word of the Lord came to Micah, and several of the others of the, of the, of the what we call the minor prophets, like Zechariah and Haggai. And we expect to read a book of prophecy, a book where God speaks a message to his people through his prophet, through his messenger. But instead we get a story, a story about a prophet and a story about a very reluctant one who ends up, as we'll see next week, getting angry with God. So it's a very strange story, and it's a bit surreal. And the writer seems to go out of his way to emphasize the strangest and really to make us chuckle. The book starts, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. And as well as being names in, in Hebrew, the, these words mean something. Uh, Jonah means dove, Amittai means faithfulness. So it's about dove, son of faithfulness. And then we get the story about the most unfaithful messenger that you could ever imagine. And I think we're supposed to laugh. And have you noticed how everything is big or huge? The word occurs 15 times in, in four chapters. It's all huge. Everything is extreme. Jonah is, is called by God to travel east, which way is east? <laughs> Let's say that way, uh, to Joppa, and it immediately sets off west in the, totally the opposite direction, to the furthest point in the known world, to Tarshish. So what genre is it? Well, to my mind, it's history, but history with a big dose of satire. It's history told in comic book style. There are things that are, are meant to laugh, meant to make us laugh. And we get some of those in, in chapter three, which we're going to look at this morning. Even the cows get dressed up in sackcloth or burlap. I think we're meant to laugh. It takes three days to go through the city of Nineveh. That's huge. In fact, the city has been excavated uh, over the last centuries, and it, is, it was big. It, it was the capital city of a huge empire. Um, and the walls of the city are about seven miles in circumference. And uh, if you remember your mathematics back in your school days, we have to divide by pi or three and a bit to get the diameter, which is just over two miles. Well, you've got to be walking pretty slowly if it takes three days to walk through a city of two miles. But the point is, it was very big. It was home to 120,000 people. And don't get me wrong, I don't believe that it's fictional. I believe that it really happened. I believe that Jonah was a real person who was delivered by a real big fish and who went and proclaimed a message to Nineveh, which led the people to turn to God. But if it's just about those events, why doesn't it finish at the end of chapter three? And it doesn't. We're going to go on next week to look at strange story in chapter four. It's weird. Um, how do we explain it? I think there's a danger in getting bogged down in discussions about the historicity of the details and we miss the big picture. Because this little book 
is an important part of the revelation of God's character and his purposes, his revelation to his people. And it's not about, it's not just about Jonah. It's intended to challenge you and me and to draw us closer into a relationship with God. So I'm going to recap very quickly on where we've got to. Let me do that with the help of a couple of poems from a book by a Presbyterian minister written in the 1970s, I think, uh, Thomas Carlyle. There's a great little commentary in the form of a collection of poems. And I love the title. It's, it's called You, Jonah. Deliberately ambiguous, I think. But it's not just about Jonah. It's about you and me as well. If you remember the beginning of the book, God's command comes to Jonah to go to Nineveh and preach against it because of the wickedness of people. And instead, what does he do? He runs away as far as he can in the opposite direction. Let's play it cool. This is Jonah addressing God. I know a better way to circumvent your silly streak of mixing love with righteous judgment. All I need to do is take the next flight west, beyond your jurisdiction. This will give you time for sober second thought. Swear off this kick of simple-minded kindness. How absurd, isn't it, to think that we know better than God or can run away from him? Yeah, I guess we've all tried to do that in one way or another during our lives. Another short poem, which starts with a, a uh, quote from Psalm 139, called No Problem, No Problem. Whither shall I flee from thy presence? Presents no problem when one ignores who owns the sea and the sky. God owns the sea and the sky, doesn't he? And the land. Jonah couldn't get away from God just by fleeing in the opposite direction, just as we can't. We can try and forget him. We can try and put him to one side. We can try to pretend that he doesn't see what we're doing or know what we're thinking. But God does know. God does know. And fortunately for us, he doesn't just ignore us. In that way, we just get further and further from God. But he finds a way of stopping us in our tracks and bringing us back to our senses. So as the story goes on, as you know, God sent a storm, didn't he? As, as Jonah was on the boat in the middle of the sea, setting off for Tarshish, God sent a great storm. But Jonah even managed to sleep through the storm, safe at sea. I prefer magnificent distances between me and God. Reserve me a quiet cubicle where my shipmate's screams will be inaudible. Let them wrestle with revolutions. I am resolved to sleep soundly. God sometimes sends storms into our lives, doesn't he, to wake us up. And often we try and sleep through them as Jonah did, but God still didn't give up on Jonah because God was there on the boat with him. Stow away. And none observed the uninvited guest who stowed away, the ablest seaman of them all. God was there on the boat, despite Jonah's efforts to get away from him. What happens? God converts the crew of the boat, gets Jonah picked up by a big fish, and deposits him back on the beach, ready to make the journey off to Nineveh. God is there. He doesn't just give up on us. But at the start of chapter 3, God simply restates his original command. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh, and proclaim to it the message I give you. Now, Nineveh, as we know, was the capital of the, of the Assyrian Empire. It was the largest, the most powerful empire that the world had seen up to that time. And as we were hearing a couple of weeks ago, the Assyrians were renowned for their military strength and might, and renowned for their cruelty to their enemies. 
Like some years ago, a little group from this church went, didn't we, to the British Museum to a little Bible history tour. And some of the stuff we saw is from the city of Nineveh. It was stolen by some British archaeologist, I'm sure. Uh, and it's there in the British Museum. Large carvings illustrating the siege of Lachish in about 700 BC. That's a city a few miles north of Jerusalem. And some of them you can see depict the barbarity and the cruelty of the Assyrian soldiers. And off Jonah goes to proclaim God's message to the city. Now, I don't know about you, but I'd have been scared stiff, scared witless. Talk about putting your head in a noose. The chance of getting very far or even coming out of life would seem very slim. I'd have been frightened silly. But as we'll see next week, this doesn't seem to have been Jonah's concern. His concern was not that he'd get bumped off. His concern was not that the people would take the hump at his message. Uh, his concern was that the message would be successful, that the people would turn to God and God would forgive him. Because in Jonah's eyes, the people of Nineveh, all of them were despicable and deserved nothing but the wrath and the punishment of God. So Jonah very reluctantly proclaims his message to the people of Nineveh. And like much about this book, it is very strange. It's surreal. I was saying earlier that everything in this book seems to be exaggerated. It's huge. It's large. Uh, but the exception is, is Jonah's message, isn't it? Forty more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. It's eight words in English. In the original Hebrew, it's five words. Um, now, I think it's very likely that Jonah said a few more words than, than five. I think it's very likely that the writer has condensed it. It's only a short book after all. But if you remember back to your school days, when we used to do pracy in, in English, <laughs> uh, the skill was in reducing the number of words, but still preserving the sense, wasn't it? You had to keep the important things retain the important ideas. But all we get in Jonah's speech is a prediction about the overthrow of the city in 40 days. In fact, if you remember back to chapter 1, uh, Jonah is originally commanded, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. But there's no, nothing about wickedness in Jonah's message. He gives no reason for the overthrow of the city. And what's even more surprising is there's nothing about God. There's no mention, is there? Forty more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. There's just a warning about a coming disaster. And you get the impression that Jonah didn't want to say too much because he really didn't want the people of Nineveh to respond. But in God's providence and in the power of his spirit, Jonah's message was enough. And we're simply told the Ninevites, oops, the Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth or burlap in the translation that Vanessa read to us. And as we look at the following verses, we'll see more about the effects of, of the message, but two things strike me from, from that little statement. First of all, all of them, from the greatest to the least, were involved. Now, if we think about a big city, and we're told later it's 120,000 people, there must have been plenty of tradespeople. There must have been plenty of people who weren't part of the military. There must have been plenty of people who weren't cruel or didn't exploit others. There must have been plenty of women and children, plenty of people who probably wouldn't have thought themselves as wicked. 
But what they don't seem to have done is what we might have done, to blame others. They didn't say, it's not my fault. I've never killed anyone or mistreated anyone. If we've mis upset God, it must be those people over there, not me. They didn't say, I do my best to be good and tell the truth. No, they all repented. They all turned back to God. It's so easy, isn't it, for us to blame others and to claim to be innocent ourselves. Say it's their sin, not mine, that God objects to. As we look around our world today, there's not many people who would disagree with the idea that it's in a mess. There's war and there's suffering that that always brings. There's poverty and starvation. There's greed and selfishness as the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. And every good thing that we invent, every technological <coughs> advance, is used by some, isn't it, to harm and exploit the weak and the vulnerable. Our children suffer. Our mental health services can't cope. But we're so willing to blame the people over there. But it's not just the fault of the people over there, is it? It's my sin and my self centeredness and my lack of love that make the world the way it is. If the world was full of people just like me, then it wouldn't be perfect. It'd probably be in just the same sort of mess as it is at the moment. It always strikes me when I read the prayers of the, the great heroes of the Old Testament, the superheroes, the Daniels and the Nehemiahs, how they identify themselves with the sins of the people. When we look around and see the ungodliness and the sin of our society, it's so easy, isn't it, to become self-righteous and to blame others rather than to accept our responsibility for the way things are in our society. That was firstly, all of them, greatest to least. And secondly, their, their trust in God was accompanied by actions. They swapped their clothes for sackcloth, abstained from food. Now, those things may seem old-fashioned to us. We're much more sophisticated, aren't we, in this day and age? We don't need those sorts of signs and symbols. But I think if we think that way, we can so easily fall into the opposite trap, the trap of thinking that a mere mental assent to God is sufficient. All we have to do is say we believe, and that's enough. We don't have to change the way we behave. <clears throat> and true faith in the Bible is always accompanied by a change in the way we live. And we see this when Jonah's message reached the king. It seems that Jonah didn't actually get to meet the king, but it, we read that his warning was passed on to him by his officials, and that effect was dramatic. <clears throat> When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne. That must have made perhaps Jonah worried if he <laughs> saw that. Took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may relent and with compassion, turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. The people, including the king, repented. The Hebrew word is shuv. It means literally turning from going in one direction to going in another direction. And it's a word that was uh, taken by the prophets uh, talking about people's spiritual uh, outlook. They turned from going away from God to going towards God. And what did he do when he heard Jonah's warning? 
he got down from his throne, he took off his royal robes. Those were the symbols of his authority. Those were what identified him as king. And he sat in the dust, the dust from which God had made him. And if we're to respond to God's call to repent, I think that's exactly what we must do. If you remember back to the book of Genesis, Adam and Eve took the fruit didn't they, from the tree of the knowledge of good and bad. They effectively said, we're going to be the ones who decide what's good and bad, what's right and wrong. We're not going to allow God to determine that for us. We're not going to allow him to teach us his way or to follow it. We're going to assume authority over our lives. We're going not, not going to be subject to God's authority. And that's the mindset we inherit, isn't it? The mindset that characterizes our society. The mindset that says, nobody's going to tell me what's right and wrong. I'm going to work it out for myself. Not even God is going to tell me. And if we're going to repent, if we're going to turn back to God, then the first thing we need to do is get down off our throne, take off our royal robes, and humble ourselves before God. The people of Nineveh knew very little about God, didn't they? They'd only had Jonah's warning and the evidence they had from the world around them. And that was enough, strangely, to prompt them to turn to God. And we know, don't we, so much more about God and about his character, about his love and his mercy and his judgment. We know so much more about what he said about what is right and wrong and how to live. When we live this side of the cross, we have seen God's supreme act of, of love, haven't we, in dying for us on the cross. We've seen his Vindication in the battle against evil in his resurrection. We really have no excuse for not turning back to God. We can't plead ignorance. In fact, Jesus said to the Pharisees and teachers of the law in Matthew chapter 12, then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. He answered, a wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, Jonah's five words whatever. They repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now something greater than Jonah is here. That really is, I think, a very solemn warning to us, isn't it? Um, and to our efforts in witnessing to our faith in Jesus and proclaiming the gospel. Jesus is saying, look, the people of Nineveh, all they had was a very reluctant Jonah with a very few words, and that was sufficient to warn them and to turn them back to God. We know so much more, don't we? We have the life and teaching and death and resurrection of Jesus. What excuse can we possibly have for not turning to God and becoming disciples of Jesus? We don't know how long the king's repentance lasted, do we? The book finishes at the end of the next chapter. We don't know what happens after that. We do know that the Assyrian Empire came to a fairly abrupt end not many years later, and the Babylonians came and became the superpower of the day. But, and I don't think we hear anything further in their Bibles about the people of Nineveh and their faith in God. We don't know whether it lasted or whether they, soon, whether they soon slipped back into their old ways. But I do know from my own experience that I'm always trying to 
put on the royal robes again and climb back on the throne to take control over my life and to push God out of it, to say that I'm going to be the one who determines what's right and wrong, what's good and bad. I'm not going to accept God's authority in my life. And I think we need to recognize that repentance is not just something we do at the start of a Christian journey, but it needs to be the day-to-day -day experience of those who are seeking to follow Jesus. We frequently, don't we, need to examine ourselves to get down off our thrones, to take off our royal robes, to put aside our authority and to say to God, you know best, not my way, but your way. And the good news, the good news is that like the father in Jesus' story of the prodigal son, God is waiting. God is running to meet us, willing to throw his arms around us and to accept us and forgive us. He's always been that way. That's his character, even in the days of Nineveh. So we read in that last verse of the chapter, when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not, and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. <coughs> We can get worked up a bit about whether God can change his mind, whether he can be possibly be affected by what we do. And we can stray, I think, into areas far too deep and mysterious for us. We cannot fathom the depth of God. We can only know what he chooses to reveal to us about his character through his word and through, with the help of the Spirit. And God's word tells us that when people turn to him in repentance and faith, he will repent, relent and he will forgive and he will welcome him, them because he is God both of judgment and love. As Thomas Carlyle writes, God changed his mind because they had changed their hearts. He repented because they repented. That is the way we word it sometimes. But always he is limited only by his limitless love. God invites us to repent, to be people who regularly repent, to turn away from our self-centeredness, to turn towards him, to seek his forgiveness and to trust in his limitless love. That's a love that extended to the people of Nineveh and also extends to you and me and the people of you. That's the love that sent his son to die for us so that we may be forgiven. Father, we thank you for the cross. We thank you for the symbol of your love and our forgiveness. We pray that you would draw us back to the cross, the place where heaven meets earth, and send us out to follow the way of the cross, to be your hands and your feet as we seek to serve you in your world this week. For Jesus' sake. Amen.